to Nita's excerpts from the experts, seven minute learning sessions with researchers and practitioners in the field of eating disorders and families and individuals who share their experiences and perspectives. I'm your host, Sarah Bowie Keaton. This week, our guest is Dr. Christine Peet. She is the director of the National Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders, known as NSEED, and is an associate professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. As the director of NC, Dr. Pete is focused on improving eating disorders care by providing education and training to a variety of healthcare providers. This week, Dr. Pete will be speaking about frontline medical providers and their role in assessing and treating eating disorders. Dr. Pete, welcome to our program. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me here. So how much do frontline medical providers know about eating disorders? Yeah, you know, it's it's a tough question because we don't really have good data in terms of how people are educated about eating disorders in a routine graduate or medical program. What we do know, however, from the scant data that are out there um, is that most healthcare providers, whether they're physicians, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, they're not typically getting information about eating disorders. And if they do, it might be in a single lecture. Um, We know that um, in residency programs, so for physicians, um, they aren't required to receive education or training on eating disorders. So if they do happen to receive any of that kind of training, it's sort of just by happenstance. They may have a professor who's particularly interested. There may be a lecture or two. Perhaps if you're lucky and you're in residency, um, there's actually a formal rotation that you can go through as part of your clinical training. Um, But I think the last numbers that I saw were that less than 6% of residencies actually offer that kind of training in the first place. Um, So really, we're sort of in this um, interesting and kind of challenging position where folks that are on the front lines of healthcare have actually received very little, if any, training on eating disorders. That's pretty remarkable to hear that since eating disorders are the number one um, reasons for death for any mental health disorders. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is sort of a shocking number. Yeah, I think especially knowing that not only are these really common conditions, right? So somewhere around 28 million Americans are going to struggle at some point in their lifetime. As you mentioned, they are also life-threatening conditions. So, um, you know, our thinking is that if more healthcare providers have the education and training that they need, then we can catch people earlier in their illness progression and help get them connected to the care that they really need to get into recovery. So any recommendations that you have for um, individuals or parents, family members that are seeking treatment for their loved one that has an eating disorder when they're approaching their pediatrician or their primary care provider? Yeah, I love this question. I think that um, first and foremost, if you are a parent, a caregiver, a loved one of someone who's struggling with an eating disorder, you oftentimes are in a position to be able to observe Um, and sort of describe some of the changes that are happening within your child or your loved one. So you might notice that they're not eating in the same way that they typically do. Maybe you're noticing changes in their mood, changes in the way that they interact with you as a family member. Those are things that you're going to be much closer to than a pediatrician or a primary care doc would be. So using your intuition in that way and really noticing when there are things that are concerning or different enough for you to kind of raise some of those red flags. I think being willing to approach your pediatrician or your primary care doc and say, listen, this is what I as a parent am observing. And here's what I'd like to share and why I'm concerned. Um, And it's not that your pediatrician or your PCP is wanting to be willfully ignorant of these conditions. But if they don't know what questions to ask, if they haven't received the education and training that they need to detect these conditions, they're kind of working at a disadvantage. So you might want to try and partner with your pediatrician and partner with your PCP and say, listen, here's the expertise that I bring as a parent or as a loved one. I'm wondering what we can do to address this together to care for my child or my loved one who I'm concerned has an eating disorder. That's um, great advice. You'd think that there would be screening at most of these doctor's offices, but that sounds like that is not widespread. 
Um, it's not at this point, unfortunately. Um, I think especially for children and adolescents, one of the real shortcomings when it comes to screening children and adolescents for eating disorders is that the current um, assessment or measurement standards that we have are actually just not feasible for use in primary care. They may be too long of a form. They may be something that requires too much time and a brief pediatric visit. Um, we have some decent screeners on the adult side, um, but uh, much less so on the pediatric or adolescent side. So um, not only is it not a routine part of practice, we also have a gap in our research literature in terms of identifying the right kinds of measures for use in a pediatric setting for screening. So I know that there is a great questionnaire resource on the NIDA website for questions for parents or loved ones to ask, um, maybe bringing that with them to their appointment with the doctor might be helpful. I love that idea because like you mentioned, the, the NIDA screener is something that can be administered at home. It's something you can do in the privacy of your own room. You can respond to those questions and then you're exactly right. You can either screenshot that or print it out and bring it with you to a pediatrician's office. That way it's not necessarily the screening portion that's getting done in the visit, but you're bringing the information to your healthcare provider in a way to try and partner with them for your loved one that you're concerned about. So what are three takeaways that you would um, give as advice to parents and family members that are watching this? I guess three pieces of advice I would start with are number one, if you are a parent or a caregiver and you are concerned, that is enough reason to ask for more information. Um, you are in a position where you know your children well, you know kind of what their typical is. And if you're noticing that there's some kind of deviation from that, I think it's worth it to look for more information to educate yourself, maybe kind of present that need a screener, see if that's something that your child will be open to responding to. Um, because I think that if you are in a position where you have this concern, the earlier you can act, usually the better in terms of getting somebody into care. Um, I think the second piece of advice or take home point that I might give um, is that it can be a really powerful dynamic when parents or caregivers work together with primary care colleagues. Um, it's that combination of the sort of expert knowledge of the family member and that social support network, in addition to the expert medical knowledge of the physicians and other medical providers that I think can create a really crucial partnership so that folks can be successful in not only getting connected to care, but being successful in that kind of specialty care as well. Um, and then the third piece I would say is that, um, you know, if there are questions that you have and you're not quite sure, um, you know, how to approach this conversation with a loved one, um, Nita has a wealth of resources in terms of directing people towards how you might start this conversation, how you might approach um, some of your concerns with your loved one in a way that's very loving and supportive, but is still communicative about those concerns. Great advice. I think what I'm hearing is to advocate, to be that partner with your loved one and your doctor to not be intimidated by the fact that they're the expert because you are the expert of your child. That's um, exactly right. Well, excellent information. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciated that, Dr. Pete. Thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. Nina's mission is to support individuals and families affected by eating disorders and serve as a catalyst for prevention, cures, and access to quality care. NIDA offers programs and services designed to help you find the help and support you need. Whether you have been personally affected by an eating disorder or care about someone who has, recovery is possible, and we're here to support you.